you know, as I embark on my uh, adventures for the day, I'm going to put a little time up there on the hill and uh, got to get some parts and stuff. I was kind of reflecting on what my next video should be. Came to the conclusion that this next one I'm going to put up may well be the most important video I've ever done. So I really want to make sure I do it right. I'm not quite sure if it can be done right in just one video, but I'd need to start. And that has to do with felling and, uh, and a little bit of safety. And the physics behind what happens with one of those huge trees falls is beyond the comprehension of a lot of people. It's just a lot of energy there in um, a lot can go wrong in a hurry. When a 28 inch diameter tree at the base falls and if you happen to happen to be in the wrong spot um, the damage is catastrophic. You know it's more than life threatening. And uh, You gotta start from there when you go out in the woods. You know, it's taken me a few years to get there because like most of the people who will be watching this, you're pretty sure you know how to cut down a tree. And in my world, you know, I started out doing what kids do. I happened to work cutting down some pulpwood as a teenager, and that was a big help because you started understanding the risks at that point in time. Although I was asked to do some pretty stupid things. I'm not going to get into that now, but I got some great stories from a kid. But basically, your quickness and agility allowed you to get away with a lot of stuff that as you get older or heavier or don't have it to begin with, you can't. So starting with that, and of course the whole discussion about PPEs can't be had enough. And, uh, sometimes I've sacrificed chaps for, for things and that's been a mistake. You know, I will do better in the future. Hard hats, things like that. But I think the most important, uh, actually I know the most important thing a person has to have is an open mind and an open heart to learning from people who really do put a lot of effort into trying to do this this stuff safely. Some of them put on courses and some of them don't, but being trained is, I think, something that's very important. I really do. And this is looking back over the last 40 years. My God, almost 50 years of doing this kind of thing because I started back in the, in the early 70s. So I would say that there was a time between year 2000 and say 2010 where basic athleticism and just pure freaking luck kept me from getting hurt. And um, I had a pretty good handle on what was going on, but I also had enough speed to get out of the way. And uh, the conventional cutting strategies for the most part worked. Somewhere between 2010 2018 it began to change because I began to get heavy and I began to slow down and uh, then when I was doing the strategy of felling I had done up to that point in time I realized that uh, man things are happening quick here and I'm not sure if I can <laughs> be fast enough in order to continue this approach I need to come up with something different and Matt saw had given me sort of a primer on how he was was cutting logs at the time and uh, so I adopted some of his strategy as well. So in addition to doing the bore cut that I was doing I was beginning to do a bore cut from the side and leave a little bit of hold in the back simply to give myself time and space assess the situation get another look upstairs to see if there was something wanting to come down and make my day worse than it was when I started and uh, and I adopted that style, or cut from the front a little bit on the trees that required that, that I was, you know, worried about poles and barber chairs. You know, bore cut from the side. Sometimes if I thought things were pretty easy, I would just let it go all the way through and just fall. But then I started leaving a little bit of hold wood when I was a little bit insecure, and that was a good move. Now, a couple years later, looking back, I should have started that way, but I didn't know to. But now I do. So this is what I'm passing on to you is I'm not the only guy out there who's figured that stuff out. But I'm also open-hearted enough to learn from other folks, especially folks like Matt, who I have an infinite amount of respect for. And because of that, I was able to modify my technique and develop to what I have today. 
and I'm not going to try to tell you that this is the best approach. I'm just saying that uh, the message of this video is pay attention to the guys who've kind of done this before and learn. You know, maybe your style of cutting could be modified by what you've learned from folks who've been in the woods longer than you. And that's really the meat of it. And where I ended up with may or may not be the best way. I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say it is. It's what I do, and I'm going to present it that way. But I got there because I had an open heart, and that's the message. I was willing to watch, learn, evaluate. And I'll throw a bunch in here uh, of where I am now. And when I was a younger man, I said, man, that's a waste of time. Well, now, as an older man, I realize I need the time. <laughs> so I'll put in a bunch of stuff here, but this is the backdrop for the video. The theme is evolution of felling in my world number one and understanding with humility that I'm not the end-all expert on this you really need to go out and be trained by people who really make a living doing that there's a guy in the East Coast who's done that for years under the label of game of logging I'm sure there's places like that out west but uh, the two-part message I'd like to get through to anyone who's watching this video anyone who's watching my channel get trained that's number one Number two is have an open heart. Please, please, please do the study. Try to understand the physics of what's going on and adopt a strategy where instead of rushing your way through felling, you can do it in a little more methodical pace. We're not all production guys here. You know, most of us are hobby types or firewood types, and this is who I'm talking to. And believe me, patience and being observant and being aware of the surroundings is the difference sometimes between uh, a fun day, you know, making something ready for firewood and a trip to the ER. So with that, I'm going to start folding in some video. Yeah, trees like this scare the crap out of me because you just don't know what's inside. I'm going to try to drop it on top of those. So actually, it kind of wants to go where I want to put it. Right on top of that tangled mess right there. Right between those two trees. But with the base as compromised as this, huh, I don't know if I can make that happen or not. Where am I going to have a hinge? I gotta tell you, I am not an expert. And I'm not telling you how to do this. I'm just telling you what I do. And again, I bore cut through. I'm leaving a little more hinge that I like because there isn't a whole lot of hinge. I'm not gonna get in front of that tree, but look. So I'm gonna leave a little more hinge and I'm not worried about the quality of the log at all. What I'm worried about is uh, getting it down safely without it barber chairing.
It's swaying back and forth. There it goes. Evolution of felling. Some of it's pretty funny. I look at some of this stuff and it's like when I was a kid, you do things and you wonder how you survived. Well, I look back now on some of the things I've done over the last 60 years. My God, the fact that I'm sitting here holding a camera and talking to you, um, somebody was looking out for me. And the uh, only thing I can do is hope that I can open up your mind, open up your heart so you can actually look and then go get trained and do it with an open heart and not feel like that's some sign of weakness of it in any way shape or form in fact learning how to learn is one of the most powerful tools we have as humanity I'll leave it at that this is Cyclops and the reason why this one's called Cyclops is it's my little uh, goof on all the perfecto OCD types out there and I did this muffler mod where I did my brass right and then I just didn't paint it so it looked like a big ugly eye and that's where Cyclops gets its name.
the hinges were right about what I needed. They uh, they broke instead of pulled. That's kind of what I'm looking for is for them to have enough meat with a crush down and pinch my saw but then have enough hinge where it directs the tree you know preferably I'd rather see it pull down versus pull up which is exactly what this did now you can see where I bore cut in here kind of went back and because I did that there's absolutely no chance of a big pull or uh, even a barber chair there really isn't enough hinge left to pull on the tree hard enough to make it barber chair whereas if I had just done the standard bore cut on these ash trees yeah it doesn't happen every time but it's happened often enough that I don't like doing that I'd rather take out about a third of the hinge in the front you know and then uh, do what we just did there How do you like that stump same thing here Hinge has been breaking and pulling down versus up most of the time. That one pulled up a little bit because I left it a little bit uh, heavy on the one side. This one over here. And I had a really big tree down here. Well, I wonder how many wedges I've left out in the woods over the years. <laughs> uh, afraid to even think about it. So this tree went down with a thud. I didn't video with a curse. I videoed the one next to it, but not this one. And... Uh, I want you to look at this for a second. We keep talking about cutting the stumps low. And here's two that we did in the last video. And the funny thing was, we were in about a foot of snow. So that did affect a little bit about uh, how low I could cut. More like how much I wanted to cut. Because to get any lower than what I was doing, I'd have to get into those root flares quite a bit. But uh, I think this is actually a good time to show that just a little bit, just a little bit. Notice that I went back to a standard bar. I think this is another little detail that endeared my, my 565. There, you just sit right there. Just think about what you're looking at right there is the way those root flares go out. Now, there's an old saying, and I'm not sure if it's 100% true, is the money is in the butt of the tree. Well, I guess really, that depends. I'm not gonna go there, but that first 12, 16 feet really is where the money is in these things. And I could get another six inches of tree out of that if I really fought for it. And the same over here. Let's look at this one over here. But look at these uh, 
these root flares for a second. And you don't see this in a lot of other tree species. It's something that's pretty much unique to these. And I'll set this right here. I need all of that 28. And this one was done with the blue saw. And I could have gotten another three or four inches lower with that saw with that handle. Made that point. And I remember uh, a, a fellow was asking me, why do you do your center bore cut? Take a look at the way that split. And there is your answer right there. Right there is the answer. Where it broke down on the outside there and the outside there, but it broke up into the tree here. Now the reason why this tree was not bore cut is because it was leaning back at me. I wanted enough tensile strength in that, that hinge to make sure I could jack it up over the top. And therefore I left the whole hinge knowing I was going to get a pull. But if it didn't have that back lean, I would have cut out a third of that, that hinge and I would have had no pull. And that would have saved me six, eight inches of log. And that adds up, you know. And um, so the subtle point I want to make about that is a lot of times the pro loggers who have a lot of strong opinions, sometimes they work on crews or whatever, but it's not their tree. It's not their money. Oftentimes it, they're working as a, as a hired uh, felling person for a large outfit or another logger. But when it is, when it is your tree, it is your money, in this case, it is your land. Um, getting that extra six to eight inches out of every tree, being a little bit more, you know, intelligent how you do your cuts, it adds up and it matters. It really does. But if it's not your tree, you know, I watch them out west, you see them just dropping them one after another after another, and they got these terrible pulls, and they're doing them waist high, they're, you know, really, you know, good at what they do it's not a, it's not it's not a knock on them sometimes they leave the high stump because they use that to keep trees from falling down the hill and all that but when i look at that i go man if you did that on my trees i don't want you because you're losing a foot foot and a half per tree that could be 15 20 dollars a tree that you're leaving on the on the stump so that's one reason why you cut them low is to get the extra foot extra six inches even and that's also why the saws are configured a little bit differently for me, is that with a standard handle, I can get right down there and, and cut that uh, tree pretty low. If I came out here, just think about it, if I came out here, and I'm only getting, say, 12, 16 foot out of a, a tree for a good log, and every one of my stumps is sitting up a foot, foot and a half, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That means 12 uh, stumps is one tree that I could have sold for 200 bucks. So that's the point, is... The saws are configured to cut low, and I need enough blade length to get through the tree. And uh, a lot of guys don't need that. I mean, I, I can show you a whole bunch of guys, and one of the fellows that I had on the video, he can do the whole thing with a 20 or a 24. He just hits it from both sides, and he's fast and agile. Well, I'm not either fast or agile, so I went to the longer bars so I can just do it in one cut. And um, yeah, I sacrificed some cut time because I got to cut back the flares. The guys are really, really good around here. They wouldn't cut those flares back that way because they would just reach in. They're just going to concede and reach in from both sides anyway. And so if you have a 24 inch bar, you can reach a pretty long way into the tree. And the one guy, my God, he, he makes them match up. You know, he sticks them in from both sides and he's running around. And uh, it looks like it was one bar. He's that good, but I'm not. So having the longer bar for me means I can get these larger trees and have a, a relatively, uh, you know, good stump. Now I'm going to make another point while I'm standing here looking at this. And I did not make it well when I was uh, talking about cutting these trees. You can see how I do the bore cuts. Now I did explain why a bore cut from the front sometimes and that's to get rid of those pulls on the trees that have the fiber that like to pull. Ash trees are terrible that way. 
And with the ash trees, not only can you get a pull there, but oftentimes you can get a barber chair forming at the back of the hinge, which is the other reason why I minimize the hinge, is to minimize the chance of barber chair. And I can say pretty quantitatively over the last 20 years of doing this, that even with the ash trees, when I took out a third of that hinge, I've never had a barber chair even start, even want to start. But I can also say that when I left the hinge too thick or I left it all the way across, barber chairs do happen. Now there was another thing I used to do, and I've been doing it again, is if you have just at least an inch, a uh, little higher than the bottom of your face cut, that tends to promote having it break down into the stump versus, you know, pulling. You know, I, I, I haven't quantified that yet. I just know that over the last couple of years when I've been doing that, this stump in particular, I was a little bit worried. I left that step in there, and even with a full hinge, you can see this one right here. I intentionally left that and it broke down into the stump, which was good. But also, look how much of that I, le I left there. See, that's, that's too much for me. It was a deep snow, so I understand why I did that, but I easily could have got another six to eight inches out of that tree. So that, to me, is not a good job, Walter. That was not a good job, shame on you. Now, here's another point. One more, and then I'm gonna go cut some wood. Lecturing is not my thing funny because when I do these edits on these videos I hate listening to them because I can't stand listening to myself for that long. Now when I do my bore cut from the side and again I don't consider myself an expert but uh, what I do is I will always start from from this side and I will take the bar and I'll, I'll cut in to where it's got good support and then I'll push it all the way through to here. And the reason why I do that is my hold wood is that back piece right there, but I can get a wedge right there, which is almost, which is not quite, you know, at the center of the tree, but it's pretty, it has a pretty good mechanical advantage. Now, the other reason I do this and then work my way to the hinge is because it's a lot easier cutting to the hinge this way and uh, so I have a lot of control. I can get up, turn around, look where the tip is on the other side. And I kind of work my way to get the hinge exactly as I want it before I go cut the hold wood. It gives you a lot of time. But working for this angle here, it, it's easier for me to start right here and line up the blade than it is, for example, coming from this side. Starting my bore cut like this, some guys will do this. And, uh, and then they work their way across. But now you, you're sort of having to have a little bit of skill to make sure that tip doesn't go further into the hinge than you plan or too far away. Where now you have too thick a hinge, it creates a, uh, you know, a pull or a barber chair. Now, <laughs> a confession, when I thought I was smarter than most, I used to start from here, I'd go across and I'd poke through the front, come back and then finish it off. And for the most part, it worked. But I had a couple of times when I kind of misjudged a little bit, and uh, next thing you know, I had that tree cut too much, and it pinched my bar. And I actually have that on video. So that's why I kind of stepped back and said, that's not how I'm going to bore cut. I'm not going to, you know, gamble on where the tip is anymore. I've done that for a long time, and I was pretty good at it. And that's why I changed from bore cutting that side to starting from here, going in, pushing through, and then working my way right to the hinge where it's very easy for me to line up the bar to the back of the hinge when I, you know, have my sight lines and I can go around and watch the tip. And the tree is being held by the whole wood so I have, you know, plenty of time to do that. And ever since I went to this side doing that technique, my hinges got more and more and more uniform. So, but I can show you video after video where I used to just cut straight across the back. 
and I was good at it. You know what I'm saying? A little younger, a little more agile. My eyes are better. I had a better idea where the tip was. And then uh, as I got a little older, <laughs> I started uh, being less interested in how fast I can cut the tree down, a little more interested on in how safe I could cut it down. But I even got some video last year where I was doing that same technique. And the tree would start going before I actually got to the side over here. Well, hopefully that'll be more graphic. I didn't cut that hinge quite far enough because the tree started moving and I wanted to get the heck out of there. But you can see where it pulled about to here, right there. Had I left a full hinge in there, see I was pulling here, would have gone right up the heart of the tree. Sometimes that'll actually barber chair on you. Yeah, it didn't bother me. I'd just sit there and cut a little bit and get the heck out. And I was usually, like I said, I was fast enough saw and agile enough that I got it to work without getting hurt. But when I adopted this technique, you know, again, cut like that and then plunge all the way through and then work to here. Got the whole wood there, I got the hinge. I can leave the saw in there, get out, walk around, look at my whole scenario, the tree's not going anywhere. And instead of having to cut the hinge while the tree is now in motion, I can cut the hinge to exactly how I want it, pull the saw out, get back, look around, the tree's going nowhere because it's got the, the hold wood in the back, and then uh, when I feel like I've got a good situation, I can cut it loose. And uh, that's the advantage of that approach. You know, it slows things down a little bit, but it gives you a lot more control because once that tree starts going, it's going, you know what I'm saying? You need to be out of there. You know, me doing that little cut in the back while that tree is in motion is just plain stupid in retrospect. So I think it needs to be said in, uh, I've got a couple of videos that I can wrap in here if I need some saw noise, but that's why I do what I do. Slow down, getting older, you know. That's why a boar cut out the, the middle of the hinge on some trees. You can see it right there. It's also why I've gone to a standard handle because of the way those root flares are. They just get everything in the way, you know. It's why I try to cut the stumps low because I need to get as much money out of each tree as, as possible. These things are bringing good money. I mean, I'm getting 90 cents to a buck a foot on these things. So you leave, <laughs> you leave six, eight inches like that one, you're leaving money out here in the woods. And like I had said in one other video, you leave them tall, it creates all kinds of problems when you're coming through with a tractor and trying to skid. You know, they won't bump up over the top if they're too tall. And uh, that's my lecture. That's my spiel. Let me fire this thing up and do a little bit of work down here. I need to, I need to, you know, clean that top up a little bit so I can get in there to get that one tree. <laughs> 